All righty, excellent. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Uh, I love coming to Big Data Spain. Actually, let me get back to the title slide here. Um, I, I love coming to Madrid, and especially Big Data Spain. Uh, this talk here is about AI adoption in enterprise. And uh, if you want to get the slides, uh, you can grab these online right now with uh, your mobile phones, but also that URL. I'll keep this up for a second. Just the background on this is that I work a lot with O'Reilly Media and with the Strata Conference, the AI Conference, etc. cetera. Uh, I'm one of the chairs for JupyterCon and for RevCon. So I work very closely with uh, Ben Lorica, who is uh, chair for Strata and AI Conference. And we have lately been doing surveys across the world about topics uh, related to what we're discussing here at Big Data Spain. And so one of our larger surveys this year was about machine learning in enterprise. And uh, we sent this out. Uh, we expected to send it out to a few hundred people, some people who'd attended Strata just to get a simple poll. <clears throat> Oops, OK. There. We wanted to get a poll, just a few hundred people. Unfortunately, there was a big mistake, and some of the marketing people sent it out to, I think, 15,000 people. Uh, we had over 11,000 responses back, so it was an interesting data set. And naturally, being data scientists, we wanted to try to analyze this and see what we could find out. There were some insights that were very surprising, and I think that they helped to indicate some of what's happening in big data and machine learning in enterprise these days. Uh, so the intention of the survey was we really wanted to see how is machine learning moving into mainstream business. And in, in the sense of terminology, uh, we were looking at three different persona. Uh, we were looking at uh, companies that are very sophisticated. They've been doing machine learning for five years or more, and so they have experience in this field. We're also looking at early adopters, uh, companies that have only been really doing this for one or two years, and then other companies that are just beginning to explore, just starting out to deploy machine learning, just starting to get into artificial intelligence. The distribution on this across the world, uh, you know, about half of it was from North America, uh, just because of the, the shape of our audience. But we also had very significant sample coming from Western Europe and from Asia, uh, again, throughout the world. So one of the questions is, um, how is it that the, uh, the experienced companies, how are they handling deployment of machine learning models? Because how you deploy your models in production has become a very big question. We see a lot of talks about this in the conferences, a lot of discussion about this amongst the vendors. And, uh, and so this is interesting. Um, North America, Western Europe, they lead in terms of sophisticated use. Whereas East Asia and South Asia, um, they're coming up in the world. They're really gaining as far as early adopters. And you can see the segments here. Really, the shape of what's going on with North America and Western Europe is very similar. But again, in Asia, they're, they're pushing more on the exploration. Another question is, what kind of impact has this had on organizations? So a way that we try to measure that is to understand about job titles. Are these changing? Um, are there new kinds of job titles that are being introduced? Of course, we're very much interested in seeing about data scientists and data engineer, but we expected to see other things as well. So as it turns out, uh, more than half of the job titles involved with deploying machine, models, machine learning models into production, uh, more than half of the people involved in that are data scientists. Um, there is a significant number that are still having the title of business analyst, although that's that's a little bit more historical. Um, we also see data analyst, data engineer, research scientist, machine learning engineer, et cetera. You can see the distribution on this, really data analyst, business analyst, data engineer, and data scientist were the top ones. Um, and then we started to look at how does this break down between the companies that are really sophisticated versus the companies that are just getting started. So some of the takeaways are that we are seeing newer job titles moving in. Uh, machine learning engineer is one, data engineer, data scientist, of course. Uh, deep learning engineer is another title that's being used. One thing that's interesting is the, the organizations that are very sophisticated about developing algorithms. Uh, they tend to use a, a title of research scientist for people who are really dedicated to algorithms work. There's not a lot of those, um, but it was interesting that that's developing. 
So a question that came out of this analysis was, uh, are we seeing convergence of titles? So people who used to be business analysts, are they now being called data scientists? Or are we seeing the other direction, hyperspecification? Uh, so for instance, I, I've seen people with a title of deep machine learning engineer. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but definitely there are people in Silicon Valley with that title. Um, now, something to support this, uh, was a really great talk from uh, uh, Miriam uh, Jahanshani. Uh, she's at Tap Recruit, and they're doing data science analysis of hiring data scientists. And uh, something that they reported was that actually the, the hyper specification, it gets in the way of building teams for data scientists. Um, they do see a lot of title inflation, uh, particularly amongst people who are not as experienced in the field. Uh, but they also found that if you try to uh, filter to go after more experienced people, like senior data scientists, you actually end up not getting as good of candidates. Um, so in general, try to avoid some of the hyperspecification. Hopefully, we'll see more of the consolidation of these titles. There's also an interesting thing in that uh, this is a report that came out from Deloitte a year ago. Uh, and the idea is that now we're seeing teams of people and machines, a kind of a mixture of, of roles. So Deloitte had gone out and uh, interviewed in enterprise the HR departments to try to see, are they taking this into account? Are they planning for job titles moving from people to machines or perhaps even the other direction? But are they planning on having machines as part of the workforce? They're calling it the no-caller workforce. They found out that really about 17% of the HR departments had considered this yet. So I think you'll see a lot more in terms of hybrid teams. All right, another question is who builds machine learning models? Um, and as it turns out that uh, we're seeing over half use internal data science teams, the companies that have more experience rely more on internal teams. The companies that have less experience rely more on external consultants. One thing that really was kind of surprising is that AutoML, although it's being pushed, and there's a lot of different cloud services for this, the buy-in on this still is pretty low. It's a single-digit percentage. So we're not seeing a lot of cloud services being leveraged yet for, for actually building the models. Perhaps it will change. Um, so one thing that's been kind of a, a, a debate, uh, definitely there have been a lot of arguments on different sides. What's the methodology that's needed to work with machine learning? Because when I go out and I talk with people in enterprise, if you say data, they say Agile. If you say engineering, they say Agile. You know, anything you say, they say Agile afterwards. So are we actually doing Agile machine learning? And as it turns out, no. Um, we, we really wanted to take a look at the companies which were more mature in this kind of practice and see what are they reporting about process. <clears throat> and as it turns out, you do see a lot of companies saying Agile, um, but it's not necessarily the default. Um, so at this stage, we can say that about a third of the respondents used no methodology. And in particular, the sophisticated organizations were leading on what they were saying as other. Um, we didn't have a name for it yet. So we, we don't necessarily see that there's an alternative to Agile. There's something that doesn't necessarily have a name. We're going to try to probe more for that. But I'll talk about this a little bit later in the talk. Um, Something interesting that I want to point out, uh, who here has ever heard of Ron Jeffries? Anybody? A couple of hands. Okay, so Ron Jeffries came up with a lot of the, the parts of what we consider now to be Agile methodology. Things like Scrum, he invented that. And he was one of the signatories on the Agile Manifesto. And now he's come out this year saying that really what they were trying to push toward with the Agile Manifesto is, is nothing akin to what's being practiced now in enterprise. So his suggestion is move away from name methods, and really there's, there's just three points of what developers need to focus on to be able to adopt the spirit of what they're trying to do. Stated another way, Agile comes from about 20 years ago. And at the time, the way that you create value was to have a software code base and iterate on that software code base rapidly to be able to get features in front of customers you treated the software developers almost as interchangeable parts because, well, it was a lot more fluid, it was a lot better than what was being practiced before. Um, but when it came to data in that kind of world, when you're building a, a 
software application, you would have a data model, you might be using a database with a schema, there might be some uh, unit tests related to it, but really data wasn't as much of a first-class citizen. And now things have changed. 20 years later, most of the companies are using open source. Most of the critical software that you rely on for your business, somebody else manages it, somebody else owns it. You may not even pay them money for it. Instead, now, the value creation is not about iterating so much on the software as it is about maintaining your data, cleaning up your data, getting labeled data, getting large enough data sets in place to be able to train machine learning models. So the area where the value creation is happening has shifted from iterating on code to how do we work with data? And that brings in a lot of other factors um, that really aren't accounted for 20 years ago by Agile. Um, I'd like to point out there's a, a, a really great talk from uh, David Talby from Pacific AI. He does a lot of work with machine learning and healthcare. And uh, he's had some excellent talks at the O'Reilly conferences about what goes wrong when you deploy machine learning models in production. And uh, it's, it's really fascinating because he has a lot of excellent insights on that, uh, actually uh, some, some pretty amazing failures that have happened in hospitals and whatnot. So right after one of David's talks, I was giving a talk and I, I took like five minutes to put together this slide to show some contrast between what we think of in terms of software development, say like web development, versus what we're doing with machine learning in production. And uh, there's a few points from David Talby, also from Pete Warden at Google, uh, that are included here. But the gist is this, when you're building software, like in a mobile web dev, you put your most experienced people up front. Your architects, your team leads, they're involved with requirements and specifications. And then as a, a project matures, you get more and more people involved who don't have as much experience. With machine learning, it's exactly the opposite. If you have a data set and you want to train a machine learning model, that's a homework exercise. Your most junior people on the team can do that as homework. The problems come in once you've deployed models in production and those models are interacting with the customers. That's when things happen that are unforeseen, that no product manager could ever specify in advance. That's when the problems of security and ethics and bias and all the issues related to compliance come into play. So what happens is we see over and over again, organizations put their most senior people, their most experienced people after deployment, as opposed to earlier in the stage. So I, I think that a lot of the notions of methodology are actually inverting, and we'll have to take that into account. Um, especially when you're talking with concerns about bias, fairness, ethics, privacy, security, other areas of compliance, these are really accentuated. There's a difference between the practice of coding and the practice of learning. Okay, so who makes decisions about machine learning within organizations? Um, we just want, we wanted to measure this one to see if we could find out anything about how uh, corporate structures uh, are, are handling machine learning. And we got some surprises. Typically, you would expect to have product managers determining things like key metrics. What are the value, uh, the, the measurements that are used to um, estimate success of a project? And as it turned out, yes, there are product managers, but only about a third. And in fact, when you look at the difference between the sophisticated organizations and the less sophisticated organizations, it turns out that the data science team leads uh, are, are getting a push there. They're doing a larger share relatively. And you see this especially in contrast with the organizations that aren't as experienced. So that kind of, of decision making is being pushed away from product managers toward data science team leads. And uh, you know, this, this would be a challenge. This was something that we saw back in about 2008, 2009, when there was first this notion of data science being uh, brought forth at places like LinkedIn and Facebook and others. There was a lot of immediate tension between product management and data science, one being a little bit more intuitive, one being more quantitative. And it took a couple of years, but eventually that worked out, and that led to stronger notions of data-driven organizations. There are wonderful examples. Some of the early people who were identified as data scientists later became product executives at companies. Monica Rigotti from LinkedIn, for instance. Uh, so we think that this is an area that's evolving. Um, also, who sets the priorities for the team in general? 
And again, you see a lot from product managers, but you see a growing amount from data science leads, particularly with the sophisticated organizations. So I, I think that this is interesting. It, it indicates that there is knowledge about data science and machine learning that is within the data science teams that's not necessarily out in product management or in the executive teams yet. Um, at least that's part of the analysis we get from this. Now, what kind of metrics are used for success? Uh, so if, if you've heard of something called Lean Startup, I was the uh, director of data analytics at that company, InView. And we had very sophisticated means of doing A-B testing, a lot of customer experiments, uh, a lot of KPIs that we were monitoring. Um, sometimes, though, we ran into failure modes because we would have a product that was just being measured on one KPI as opposed to being measured on several. And as it turns out, this was an interesting area. Um, definitely a lot of organizations are looking at business metrics, like lean kind of methodology would, would put you toward. Uh, but more and more, again, almost half are using statistical measures, more kinds of machine learning evaluation, uh, which again requires a lot of that domain knowledge. And uh, then the surprise was that we're seeing actually quite a lot who are already measuring for bias and fairness. Overall, it was 17%, but if you look at the sophisticated organizations, um, that came out to, uh, yeah, it was, it was 19. So um, this is interesting. We didn't anticipate that quite as many corporate organizations would be already taking bias and fairness uh, into account in their pipelines for evaluating machine learning models. We thought that this would come later. Now, it's very hard to measure for fairness in machine learning models. Part of the problem is there, there are multiple metrics for, for fairness. And if you try to just use one metric, you get in trouble. Uh, there's a great interview here from Sherrod Gull and, and Sam Corbett Davies. They have a research group at Stanford which is looking into the math of fairness and bias in machine learning. And it really comes down to optimization problems. And the long and short of it, without going into the math, is that it's impossible to get this 100% right. So when you're in business, you have to own up to the fact that your machine learning models will not be entirely fair, and you want to make the errors in the direction that's right. You want to do the right thing, you want to own it. Uh, make the decision that won't hurt your customers, that won't hurt the public. Um, because there's, there's no perfect answer. This is a message that needs to be elevated now up to executive levels, to have them understand what really, what is this risk all about? How does it work? What are the dynamics? Um, and, and along with this too, if you haven't heard it, I think it's something that needs to be talked about more. Um, Goodhart's law, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases be being a good measure. Um, and I think that that was something we definitely learned back when we were working on lean. So don't just focus on one KPI. If you go to a bank, they'll have a range of different KRIs and KPIs for any product line. They're looking at risk, they're looking at performance as well. Okay. Um, what is within the model building process? Essentially, what are the checklists that organizations go through before they deploy a machine learning model into production? And uh, as, it, as it turned out, um, you know, we saw like 54% uh, had some experience with checking for fairness and bias. 40% uh, overall were checking for fairness and bias. Um, here's the, the details on that. Explanation, uh, transparency, interpretation, whatever you want to call it there, um, there are a lot of great tools that are coming out for this. Uh, I really like uh, the, uh, there's an open source project called Skater that's kind of an umbrella for tools such as Lime and Shap and Anchors and others, uh, really working on having a variety of different types of explainability for machine learning models. And it's interesting how much this is already out in the field in production. And it's especially interesting to see how there's much more of a push on this for the sophisticated organizations, much less of a push on this for the, the organizations that are just getting started. They haven't found out yet how important this is. Um, okay. At looking into just how do the sophisticated companies differ, there were four takeaways. Um, the more sophisticated companies tend to use specialized roles, data scientists, data engineer, et cetera. Um, they tend to rely more on internal data science teams as opposed to going outside, outsourcing it, or necessarily using the cloud. 
uh, they employ more robust checklists, if you will, before they deploy models. They've learned about the risks and how to try to prevent those. And also, they're having more and more of their data science team leads set the priorities and, and the evaluation criteria for success when they're um, putting products out into the field. Um, and, and this is important. Uh, I want to show here a segmentation of business, looking across industry. And this comes from uh, MIT Sloan report from 2017. There's also related reports that have come out of McKinsey Global Institute and, uh, and some other research as well that we, we put together. Um, but essentially, we can look through a lens of AI adoption across enterprise. We can say that there's one segment of unicorns. Um, there are maybe a dozen companies like Google and Amazon and Microsoft and IBM and Facebook, et cetera, who have been leaders in AI deploying this into production for a long time. The thing that's characteristic about them is that they have a cloud, they have strong AI teams they've paid a lot to build, and they also have business lines that develop data sources, data that can be labeled, data that can be used and monetized in other business lines. So they're very savvy about balancing those three priorities and leveraging them. Um, now, if we look at the other segments, though, again, there's like a dozen that have food first mover advantage, but amongst the other two segments, the adopters of machine learning versus the other companies that are, are legacy, more laggards in that field, it's about a 50-50 split. Um, and the ones who are the adopters tend to have three things in common. They're facing problems with talent gap. Everybody's reporting about that. They have competing priorities. Do they invest in AI versus do they invest in better security? Things like that. And yes, as I mentioned, security breaches put a lot of pressure on how do you leverage uh, your, your data sources. A fourth thing that's coming up for the adopters is that they are seeing the, the first movers get advantage leveraging their horizontal business units, such as Amazon, um, to erode the verticals that other businesses have. So the, the adopters of AI now are facing a lot of challenges from, um, again, Amazon, Google, et cetera, that have kind of a first mover advantage and are moving out into, into other areas. Obviously, Amazon versus retail is a, is a pretty good example of this. But the adopters in AI have an advantage in that they tend to have a lot of people who know what's going on in their domain. They're, they're very good with domain expertise. And so if they can leverage mechanisms such as human in the loop, to combine teams of people and machines, to combine that domain expertise into the loop with automation, they may have some advantage over the first movers, over the unicorns. Um, typically, companies like Google and Amazon, they like to go after products that have more automation as opposed to less. So human in the loop is an area for the early adopters to really get some advantage and, and put their people to good work. In the bottom uh, row, though, for the legacy companies, the things that they share typically they have trouble recognizing business use cases for AI. Even if it's in front of them, they would not necessarily recognize it. They also have trouble that most of them are buried in tech debt. Um, and you know, the estimates are that a lot of enterprise, really you have to get your data silos knocked down, you have to get data cleaning pipelines in process, you have to get sophisticated data science practices in place. If you don't have those things, those are table stakes before you can get into AI. And for a lot of companies, even if they started today, it would be another two or three years before they would have that fundamental infrastructure in place, before they could start doing machine learning. And so that's a problem. Being buried in tech, get, tech debt is a, very much a, a corporate risk right now. Um, but at the same time, in the legacy group, they also have assets. They tend to have a lot of data exhaust that could be monetized if they could understand where to use it. Um, and for instance, Google Maps is a great example of that, where there was a telecom company that had data they weren't monetizing, and Google Maps was able to, to help produce you know, estimates of how to get from point A to point B better with it. All right, so um, getting into a little bit more of a summary, what kind of changes in, in company culture would be most needed to allow for better adoption of AI? We wanted to try to understand some of this um, as maybe more positive takeaways uh, after the analysis of the survey. 
Um, there's a great talk. This is from Jacob Ward. He used to be the, uh, the senior editor for Popular Science. He also has done work with uh, other television documentary work, I believe, with uh, 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 Al Jazeera and, uh, and others. Um, the thing is that he spent decades talking with a lot of scientists. And uh, I'm linking here to an uh, uh, interview that he did with Ben Lorica recently. It's a podcast. It's really fascinating. Um, but also, it links into some, um, some video of keynotes that he's done at the AI conference. And the point that Jacob Ward made was that, he, on the one hand, he was talking with scientists who said they were working with biologically inspired models of machine learning, having automation make decisions based off of how people make decisions. And there was fascinating work going on in that field. But at the same time, he was talking with a lot of scientists who were looking into prospect theory and behavioral economics and cognitive bias, and they were saying, you know what, as a whole, humans make terrible decisions, and here are a lot of cases where we see failures over and over. It really wouldn't be a good idea to make machines that are patterned entirely after people. Um, and so Jacob was sort of like, wait, wait, we have to stop here. I mean, there's definitely, there's a conflict between what the different areas of sciences are talking about, and in a lot of ways, social science now is well positioned to inform what's going on in computer science. Um, Maybe a flip side of this, I highly recommend, this is a, a fantastic uh, brief video, it's a, a keynote at the Velocity Conference by Omuja Miller, she's from GitHub, one of the machine learning leaders at GitHub, and she had a, a kind of uh, thought exercise. If you take the org chart for a large organization and you rotate it 90 degrees, you get something that looks very much like the architecture for deep learning. It looks very much like how neural networks work in a lot of deep layers. And you see things like connection pooling, you see activation layers, uh, you see things uh, such as even human analogs of backprop in successful organizations. You see that kind of information flow coming from the bottom up and from the top down, and the feedback loops in between. So she was exploring the idea of what is it that enterprise organizations can learn from neural networks to make their teams work better together. Really great talk. Another fascinating talk is from Cassie um, um, Kozarov from Google, and she's the chief decision scientist out of Google Cloud. Uh, she's been doing some fantastic le lectures lately about how it is that businesses fail at machine learning. Even though there's a lot of tremendous potential for deploying machine learning models, categorically, how is it that they see businesses failing at this, and what are lessons that Google has learned over the years doing that? And, and what she's pointing toward uh, in Cassie's talks, if, if I could summarize it, was it's not as much about the machine learning as it is about the decision. How do organizations make decisions together, collaboratively? Um, it's going to be partly through humans, partly through machines. And when you can start to bring that into an organization, you can really make progress, as opposed to the kind of warnings that Jacob Ward was talking about. Um, if you haven't read this book, I highly recommend. I think that for the near-term future of AI, this is probably one of the best books available. Um, Daniel Kahneman also is about work that he did with Amos Tversky, who unfortunately passed away. But uh, he, this was the 2002 Nobel Prize winner in economics. It's called Thinking Fast and Slow, and it's about different modes of cognition that people have. Uh, the book talks about system one versus system two. There's a kind of immediate response that people have, m much like my response when I was getting near that scorpion a little bit earlier in the talk, um, and that has to do with fight or flight, it has to do with more autonomic responses that people have, gut feelings. That's system one. There's also system two where people take time to think about things, but that requires a lot of energy. We have brains, we, we burn a lot of carbs to run those brains, and system two is something that we don't do as our first foot Toward because you know if you walk into a room and there's a bunch of snakes, you don't want to take three or four minutes to say, well, what kind of snake is that? That's interesting. You really, you just want to run the other way, or if there's a bunch of scorpions. So um, this is a really fantastic book because it breaks down some of the problems that people have with cognition, especially in organizations. And these are some of the very same problems that we're encountering now as organizations in enterprise roll out machine learning. Um, recently, there was an effort by the World Economic Forum uh, to prepare the AI agenda for the Davos conference coming up next year, and I, I'm grateful to get invited to participate in a, in a workshop to help put part of this together. 
Uh, we came up with an AI ethics toolkit, which is being targeted at the board level, because the, the point is that I think we know now how to train people to do work with machine learning. At an individual contributor level, we have some really great understandings of how to move forward on that. Um, we're beginning to learn how to talk about leading teams that do AI. So at a manager level, okay, we're getting some understandings about this. But at the executive level, and more importantly, at the board level and the interface between board and executive, that kind of tension there, there is not a lot of understanding of how to grapple with the hard problems of AI. And of course, we've seen this in industry with a lot of companies struggling with data breaches and ethics problems. Uh, this is really where we have to target for the next phase of, of adoption of AI in enterprise. So at Davos, there will be a, a launch of a toolkit targeting board members. And the thing is, I mean, I, I've been on the board of directors of two publicly traded technology firms. Um, at this point, my beard is getting a bit more white. Um, a lot, your typical kind of board members are going to be probably somebody more my age. And so they will have grown up on things like Six Sigma. Um, they will have known to say the word agile over and over. They will have been taught that uncertainty is a very bad thing and that automation is about creating a deterministic process to solve something that's very well known and, and specified. But yet, as we're introducing AI, all of those assumptions have changed. And now we're talking about systems that are inherently probabilistic. They're stochastic in nature, and they're actually doing part of the judgment that the chief executives and, and the board members would have been doing before. So board members are at this really weird, perilous point where what they knew and assumed is wrong, and meanwhile, the competition's coming after them with AI, something that they don't quite understand, and they know that there's a lot of risks. So again, Davos is gonna try to, to push this out, and others as well are looking at trying to really target how is it that the top-level executives handle that kind of cognition? Because it has to come both bottom-up and top-down. Um, and I, I think that a, a big summary for this is at this point, almost every company is a technology company. Uh, and with that, almost every company is a data company. And if you're not, I guarantee you, somewhere out there your competition is. So you have to be thinking this way. And when we, from an executive level, when people look at problems and how to assign teams to, uh, to, to, you know, to confront challenges in business, we have to think of a baseline of having teams of people plus machines. In some use cases, it'll be more people, some it'll be more machines, but we really have to think about always applying that as our baseline. Uh, and so if there's any indication of where this is heading, um, I, I'm co-chair for JupyterCon, and we had a really great JupyterCon this year. Uh, we had a lot more enterprise participation in, in Project Jupyter than we had expected. And one of the things that came out of that was we saw it's within the highly regulated environments where there's a whole lot of evolution going on rapidly for open source. Um, so as a case in point, NB Gallery is a really great uh, way of uh, providing search and discovery for large enterprise teams using Jupyter Notebooks to be able to share insights, but with strong privacy guarantees. And uh, this was created inside the United States intelligence community, and then they pushed it public on GitHub. And uh, I, I I talked with some folks about this. They were interested in, you know, would other people be able to use this software? And frankly, just about any bank needs this software. And it's, it's free, courtesy of, of US tax dollars. But uh, you know, we see this in banking, we see this in healthcare, we see this in other areas where the enterprise organizations that are facing so many risks, so many challenges because of compliance and security and ethics and the rest, they're the ones who are starting to come out with solutions. It's happening in open source. If you'd asked me that two years ago, I, I would have said that would be impossible, but it is. Um, and so if we're not talking about Agile for machine learning, what are we talking about? What, what could we call it? Um, I don't know that there's a software process name yet, but the one word that keeps coming up has to do with reproducibility. And so the, the one thing that seems like an Agile manifesto, uh, perhaps the closest to that that I've seen so far with respect to data analytics, is this report here called 10 Simple Rules for Reproducible Research in Jupyter Notebooks. And uh, this includes <clears throat> my friend uh, Fernanda Perez, who, you know, the 
co-founder of Jupiter, um, also Peter Rose out of UCSD, a number of other folks who've been involved in setting up large bioinformatics pipelines in universities where they had to have a lot of reproducibility. Um, and the takeaway is that there's a lot that science at this point needs to learn from big data, open source, machine learning, and yet there's a lot that data analytics needs to learn from science. So really it's a two-way street. Uh, so for example, in enterprise, in data science teams, you need to have that kind of scientific reproducibility and rigor so that different teams will be able to come up with the same results. Uh, that, that's one failure case that I've seen repeatedly in my career where you know, a, a, a company was struggling because every time they had 4% lift, they'd have five different product managers claiming to have two, you know, half of it. Um, and the math just didn't work. So the thing about reproducibility, pipeline, and versioning, these are key components of how the larger scope of deploying machine learning. And this paper here goes through 10 points describing really what are the right processes for teams to use when they're doing that. And with that, um, I'm eager to hear some questions. If you want to get a hold of me, um, here's contact. And I look forward to talking to lots of people at Big Data Spain. Thank you. <laughs>